Why do most hospitalists not do procedures anymore? And is this a good thing or a bad thing for patient care? So as you guys already probably know, hospitalists are performing fewer and fewer procedures. There was this great study done back in 2007 that looked at the declining number and variety of procedures done by general internists. And they basically did two surveys, one back in 1986 and one in 2004. You can see here in the 1986 survey, the median year of graduation from medical school was 1971, and uh, internists at that time were able to do 16 different procedures. Whereas in 2004, the median year of graduation was 1984, and the number of different procedures had drastically reduced down to seven. Now, some of these procedures are a little bit of fluff. I mean, they even include EKG interpretation and interpretation of chest radiography here. But I think from the purposes of what most internists you know, do at the bedside, uh, that would include procedures like paracentesis, lumbar puncture, thoracentesis, and a central line placement. And just looking among those procedures, from 1986 to 2004, there was already a steep decrease in the number of internists that could perform these procedures, down from, for example, 60% who could do a para down to 26% in 2004. And now just imagine what the numbers would look like now in 2025. And on top of that, look at what some of the procedures they were doing in 1986 included. A lot of them were doing Swan-Gans catheters. They were doing proctosigmoidoscopy. 74% of them were doing that. 37% of people were doing bone marrow aspirations and 38% were doing cardioversions. So the question is, what happened in this about 20 year period that caused uh, internists to lose so many of their procedural skills. And when we narrow it down just to hospitalists who are just doing inpatient medicine all the time, even the ones who are doing procedures do not perform them at a high volume. So this was published in 2010, and it was a survey of 1,059 respondents from ACP, 175 of whom were hospitalists. And you can see that about 39 to 50% of hospitalists were doing central lines, paras, thoras, and lumbar punctures. But even among those hospitalists who were performing these procedures, they were only doing five a year. And I think in our experience, we know that this number has pretty much continued to drop ever since then. So how about my experience as an attending in 2025? So first, I just want to show you the number of procedures I got as a resident in a large academic medical center. And this is as somebody who uh, enjoyed doing procedures. I didn't, you know, go out out of my way to go get procedures. But anytime there was a procedure, I was more than willing to go do it. And I really enjoyed doing procedures. And so you could see I did 26 A-lines. I supervised 10. I did a chest tube. I've done some uh, 10 central lines, some lumbar punctures and paras. But this is the, over the course of three years. When I speak with some of my colleagues who did training in New York or other community hospitals, the number that they get is much, much higher than in, in an academic hospital. For example, one of my colleagues worked in a New York community hospital, and he said he probably got up to 500 central lines during his residency. So this really starks in comparison. But how about since graduation? I've been uh, a full-time hospitalist ever since then. How many procedures do you think I've done in the last two years? So I actually went back and I actually have written down all the times I've done procedures. And I've done one central line. This was pretty much a, a few months out of residency. So I did one central line on the floor. I've done two paras. I, I think I may have missed one or two there because I feel like I've done a little bit more than that. And then I've done one lumbar puncture, and then I had a couple of failed lumbar punctures. So you can see it's really, really low volume. So this begs the question, why has there been such a drop off in hospitalists performing procedures? And should hospitalists even be doing procedures? If we're doing such low volume, are patients actually suffering or is this bad for patient care? So why has there been such a drop off in hospitalist performing procedures? So I think the first factor is a pretty obvious one and is one of the biggest factors in why hospitalists don't do procedures. It's very time consuming. And there's also poor compensation and poor incentive to do a procedure. If we do a procedure, it could take an hour, it could take an hour and a half. In that time, we could have done a full admission history and physical and the compensation for that is so much higher than for a procedure. Uh, again, there's just not enough volume, especially if you're practicing in an academic center where you have all these specialists and subspecialty services that can help with procedures. And I think it kind of perpetuates the cycle. So all of these factors lead to poor training and lack of experience. And so, again, people don't want to do it because 
they're not used to it. It becomes an even longer process to do it. And it's just this vicious cycle where we do less and less procedures. So here's some opinions from the internet on why people don't like doing procedures. So while you're doing them, you'll miss five pages from the nurses and get behind on the 15 notes you have to write for the day. Cherry on the top is discharge summaries and hour long updates with family. Most of the time it's revenue. It's just not worth the time. For a paracentesis, and that's ordering the stuff at bedside, the procedure itself, heaven help you if it's draining to gravity, you'll be there much longer. Cleaning up and sending the stuff out, you could have seen two or three other patients or gotten more discharges out the door. All risk, no reward. If you're a hospitalist on a salary, you won't be making extra performing procedures, but you will face the consequences if you F up. Plus, the time wasted doing a procedure, you could have seen a few patients, really no incentive for a hospitalist to do them. Many IM residents skip out on doing procedures, so they become attendings who can't do procedures, so they refer everything out. This leads to their residents not getting the opportunities to learn procedures, even if they want to. This cycle is exacerbated at academic centers where proceduralists are in-house all day. Ultimately, you end up with the ABIM removing all procedure requirements completely from IM residency requirements, a decision which was supposedly caused by the pandemic, but is certainly not going to be reversed now that the pandemic has settled down. They could choose to learn as attendings, but the fact is that the type of small bedside procedures we're talking about, Thora, Para, LP, Central Line, Joint Aspiration Injection, are net negative on productivity. The RVUs they generate are not worth the time required to do them, so most choose to refer the procedure out and do another admission instead. I like this uh, example that somebody posted, and it's very realistic to what a hospitalist's uh, perspective on doing procedures is like and what our experience is trying to do them at bedside. So exam of a bedside Thora. See patient, discuss procedure, have them sign consent. Go get all the supplies from a central supply because that unit almost certainly does not have all the procedural supplies. Find ultrasound three floors away in the MICU. And I will say we have a lot of trouble even just getting the ultrasound from the MICU because the MICU needs to use the ultrasound too. They don't like people randomly coming in to take away their ultrasound all the time. And I totally agree with his part of not being able to find all the supplies. I almost always have to go to like two or, two or three different supply rooms to find all the supplies. Come back, clear four days worth of Shasta and BS from their bedside table, call the nurse to help you position them, wait 15 minutes until nurse is free, position them, they have to pee, step out and wait another 15 minutes for them to pee, repeat step eight, set up for the Thora, do the Thora, dispose of all the sharps in the tiny sharps container in the room that's on the opposite corner wedged between a giant lazy boy lounge chair and the closet, clean up all the detritus, print out all the labels you want sent, and label everything correctly because the bedside nurse is three months from graduation and has never seen pleural fluid before, much less know the best way to send them in your hospital without them being lost. I think anybody who's been an IM resident or been a hospitalist has probably experienced something similar to this. This poster actually contrasted it with getting a thoracentesis in the IR suite, for example, where everything is streamlined, all the techs know exactly what to do, the patient is just rolled in and they just do the procedure right there and the patient is rolled out immediately after. There's like no downtime. So it's very different when you're doing it in an actual procedural suite. Another interesting reason that internal medicine residents and hospitalists have had less opportunities for procedures is actually because of the growth of the ED specialty. So this is very interesting to me, but emergency medicine became a specialty in 1979. But prior to that, a lot of ED physicians, they were just internists who were working in the ED. So these internists, the ones who liked doing procedures and liked seeing patients in the emergency room, they actually split off to specialize in emergency medicine. And subsequently, with the growth of emergency medicine and the restriction of board certification in 1990 to EM residencies, opportunities for procedures in the ED for IM residents uh, significantly decreased. And in general, we've just had decreased opportunities for procedures overall. So there's been more subspecialty services available to help with procedures. With improving diagnostics, certain procedures are needed less frequently. And there's been less need for central lines in the post-early goal-directed medical therapy for sepsis era. So back, you know, pre-2010 or so, almost every patient that was coming in with sepsis was being treated with early goal-directed medical therapy. Uh, which included getting central access or a central line in pretty much all these patients. And so they were just doing tons and tons of central lines back then. And now we don't really do that. So that leads us to our next question. And that is, should hospitalists even be doing procedures? Is it good for patients or is it bad for patients for us to be doing it, especially at the volumes that we're doing it? 
So a growing literature shows that regular performance of procedures is associated with lower complication rates. If most hospitalists truly do perform only a handful of bedside procedures a year, it is debatable whether they are performing a sufficient number to remain comfortable, much less proficient with them. And I think there's all sorts of factors arguing why hospitalists maybe shouldn't be doing procedures. So first of all, we don't do them enough. They are time consuming and we are not incentivized to do them. Other specialists can do them better. There's been multiple studies showing the success rates of uh, subspecialties like IR are far higher than bedside procedures with a hospitalist. And we may have higher rates of failure and complications compared to those subspecialists, especially if they're doing it under imaging guidance. However, there actually has been growing arguments for hospitalists maintaining their procedural skills. So I want to take a look at this study uh, done in 2017. So examining invasive bedside procedure performance at an academic medical center. And to summarize some of the findings, they found that the primary team performing a procedure had decreased delays in obtaining procedures compared to doing it with radiology. So 41% faster. There was actually no difference in complication rates, and there was decreased procedural costs. On average, doing the procedure through radiology cost $663, whereas it only cost $134 when done by the primary team. In this article, which we actually looked at earlier, they argued that hospitalists should continue doing procedures because there is a need for hospitalists to perform them enough so that they can adequately role model, teach, and supervise trainees. And also, one of the advantages of hospitalists is that we are in the hospital 24-7. And so the around-the-clock availability improves delivery of procedures in a timely manner. In this study done in 2021, they found that creating a hospitalist-run procedure team led to shorter length of stay, and it was actually significant, 88 hours shorter. Imagine that, your patient discharging three days earlier because you had a hospitalist-run procedure team, or 20% shorter length of stay. And then another study found that there was actually a decreased number of transfusions and ICU transfers compared to IR. This was done in 2008. It's actually a kind of surprising um, finding to me because I feel like IR has probably has better success rates with their procedures, especially with their imaging. But I don't doubt the decreased number of transfusions because as hospitalists, uh, I think we're a little bit more familiar with the recent literature on doing paras and things like that. And so we don't give as much FFP and platelets and things like that before doing paras because the evidence for doing that is very poor. Whereas sometimes for these non-medicine uh, focused specialties, they may still be being more on the conservative side with these transfusions, which is not a totally benign thing to do. These transfusions have complications. Here are some more studies that showed that admission to paracentesis time done by hospitalists was 43 hours versus 52 hours when compared to those done by IR. And the median length of stay was uh, 174 hours versus 223 hours compared to procedures done with IR. Furthermore, many procedural specialties such as IR are not adequately staffed on weekends to perform these procedures in a time-sensitive manner, even in research-rich areas. And this kind of goes back to the around-the-clock availability of hospitalists because we are here all the time, we're here on the weekends, IR, they have much, much less resources and much less staffing on the weekends. So think about all the times you've tried to get a procedure done, but it's the weekend and it's delayed until Monday. There was actually this great outer article uh, in the Journal of Hospital Medicine where they had a, an argument for hospitalists performing their own procedures versus against hospitalists performing their own procedures. And uh, one of the arguments for hospitalists continuing procedures is that these decreased delays are actually very, very clinically important. So some of these procedures are very time sensitive, such as diagnostic paracentesis for suspected SBP, lumbar puncture for suspected meningitis, or IV access. For example, delayed paracentesis in patients with SBP has been associated with increased mortality. And delayed paracentesis after 24 hours is associated with increased risk of ER visit within 30 days of discharge, higher rates of mortality, and acute kidney injury. I think we've all also run into that situation where patient wasn't able to get a lumbar puncture for multiple days and was just empirically started on treatment for bacterial meningitis. And then the LP is finally done and it's completely sterile. And now we don't know exactly if they had a true diagnosis of meningitis or what the organism was. And so that's another common scenario that we run into. So all of this has started to lead to the rise of what they're calling medicine procedure services. So 75% of surveyed institutions in one study 
study now have a medicine procedure service. You can take a look at this article from 2024, but some of the findings were that groups with medicine procedural services had higher procedural volume compared to those without. In this study, they saw that there were increased procedure volumes and self-efficacy among medical residents when there was a medicine procedure service. There were high success rates, low complication rates, high patient satisfaction, and decreased length of stay. And so another thing that they found is that hospitalists on these medicine procedure services typically become this kind of self-selected, procedurally inclined subset of hospitalists. And that allows them to get more reps in, whereas the hospitalists who don't like doing procedures can continue just doing their normal rounding, but with this added support of the medicine procedure service. And hospitalist proceduralists retain the advantage of being able to better weigh the risks and benefits in the context of the patient's medical condition compared to IR. There were more procedures done, so 24.8 weekly versus 7.9 in centers without a medicine procedure service. And one of the other great benefits is that it actually gives procedural teams like IR the bandwidth for more complex interventions. So if you actually read how interventional radiology feels about being the dumping ground for all these lumbar punctures and paras and things like that, they really don't like it. They don't like having to do these simple bedside procedures and just getting dumped on all the time. They would much rather be doing these complex procedures. And I think that would be beneficial to all of us. I already get to do the more complex procedures. And when us as hospitalists consult them for complex procedures, you know, they're, they're going to be able to do it more quickly because they're not just totally backed up doing all these routine bedside procedures. Medicine procedure services also allow for standardization of procedural training, and there were increased procedural charges. So these medicine uh, procedure services generated a lot of revenue for the hospitalists and the hospital. So $90,000 up to $787,000 over the course of a year, I believe, after uh, implementing a medicine procedure service. And so again, there are multiple studies that have been showing the benefits of uh, implementing these medicine procedure services. So how do you feel about hospitalists doing less and less procedures? And is it a good thing or a bad thing? And what are your thoughts on the rise of medicine procedure services moving forward? Personally, I think it's very exciting, and it seems like this is going to be a trend that may become more popular over the next few years and may start to lead to this kind of renaissance in hospitalists being able to perform procedures again. I think for me personally, I think it'd be a great thing to see. I would love to be doing more procedures and just helping out patients. It's also just so much more satisfying, and I think it strengthens the patient-doctor relationship when you're taking care of them as the primary team, and then you are actually able to therapeutically help them by doing a procedure such as a para or a thora just right on the spot without having to wait for massive delays. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Thank you.